But when you realise that it's the home of pretzels, frankfurters, sauerkraut, potato salad, hamburger and our favourite cakes, wines and beers, you know that the German influence on the world of eating is incredible. And the Germans love nothing more than a great meal and a big drink. My mission, to find out what's made German food what it is and where it's headed now. Boris? I'm going to start my journey by exploring the incredible diversity of Berlin cuisine before heading northwest to the German fishing capital, Hamburg. From there I sample the fine wines of the Rhine Valley and the Black Forest's most extravagant cake. Then it's on to beer and sausage country around Bamberg, before facing the chaos of Munich's original and best Oktoberfest. Throughout Germany's history, Berlin has been a centre of art, science and education, attracting a cosmopolitan society, a diversity of culture and, of course, food. This all ended abruptly with the partition of the city at the end of the Second World War. But the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 brought back Berlin's capital status and its incredible vitality. Food and drink lie at the heart of this, from the largest food hall in Europe at the department store Cardeve, to the dozens of markets, cafes and restaurants. Berlin is foodie heaven. German Jewish culture has influenced the entire Western world, especially the United States, where words like kitsch, schmaltz and chutzpah are as much part of the language as bagels, kosher pickles and chicken soup are part of the diet. The place to go for kosher food in Berlin is Archenoa, where you'll find the finest chopped liver, latkes, gefilte fish and a lesson in Jewish-German food culture. It's a cultural link that goes back to the origins of Yiddish, a blend of Hebrew and upper-class German from the 15th century, as I soon learn from the restaurant's most regular customer, Dr. Martin Unger. It's almost as if there's this melting pot, um, you know, a language melting pot, a cultural melting pot. Right. But when, it, when it's taken to other countries, it's the food becomes a language in itself. Of because course. people take the, all the influences and they have these foods and then they take them to another country. Because bagels, for example, are everywhere in America, aren't they? Even here, it's coming backwards. From America. <laughs> <laughs> because originally, you must remember that the bagel came from Poland yes. over 100 years ago. How and what, nobody knows. Where it came from, why it has a hole in it. We can also surmise that because of that bagel, you also have the Dunkin' Donut. A Dunkin' Donut. <laughs> well, it's a donut. It has a hole. Classic bagel breakfast is bagel, cream cheese, and smoked salmon. And you were telling me that um, there's a special reason for having cream cheese in your bagel. Yes, that was uh, because it takes away the thirst. Because don't forget the, the actual uh, the, the lux or, salmon, or yeah. the salmon. It's a smoked salmon. So it's quite salty. It's really salty. So you would be extremely, extremely thirsty. So they put the cream cheese on top. To kind of dilute it and give you... It's really Well, the thought of that was very ingenious. Very clever. Gefilte fish, meaning filled fish, is usually made with fresh carp stuffed with a blend of fish, egg, breadcrumbs and onions, served cold with a sweet and colourful beetroot salad. After all this talk, I think we should try um, this gefilte fish. By all means, try it now. Such a fantastic colour, isn't it? It's a lovely combination. I need to have a bit of the fish, a bit of the stuffing and a bit of the beetroot, is that right? right. Yes. Okay. And then we see the difference. What does it taste like? Mmm. Mmm, it's very, it's quite subtle, isn't it? That's that right. That kind of brings out the flavour of the beetroot. That's right, that's right. It's a very good texture. The, 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 um, the filling is really delicious. As with Berlin's Jewish heritage, the communist era plays its part in the patchwork of Berlin food culture. Over the past ten years, formerly Soviet East Berlin has evolved into an energetic new city, attracting young, creative people. Chic coffee shops and restaurants have sprung up everywhere, but among some East Berliners, there is still a yearning for the good old Eastern Bloc brands. If you're a former East Berliner with a taste for nostalgia, you can have it sated here in the time war atmosphere of Ostkost.
This curious assortment of pickles, biscuits and canned foods may seem bizarre to Western eyes, but Ostkost is a living tribute to the comfort foods of communist Berlin. Now these rolls have achieved cult status, but true aficionados say they have never tasted the same since the demise of the old communist bakeries, which found themselves unable to compete in the new age of capitalism. Strange but true. This is Vau, a restaurant in the heart of Berlin. Modern German cookery is all about taking traditional ingredients but making lighter dishes. The signature dish here at Vau is knuckle of pork with kohlrabi and crayfish. Mmm. Mmm. Delicious. Now you may be surprised to know that Germany boasts the biggest number of chefs with Michelin stars outside of France, and the guy who runs this place is one of them. Collier Kleberg is the head chef of Restaurant Vau, and we're going to make paperclip asparagus and crayfish, a dish symbolic of the new Berlin. Mary Lise, could you do me a favor and take the vegetables out of the stock or the infusion? No problem. And what's this for? It's the infusion for cooking the crayfish, to give a little bit more taste than just salted water to the crayfish. Oh, I can see star anise. Yeah, star anise, a lorry, white peppercorns, a little garlic, chili, fennel, shallots, as you see. Very important is cumin. We boiled it for 10 minutes just for the flavors of the vegetables to go into the stock. Okay. Bring it to the boil now. Okay, I'll turn that right up. And we have to wait a little. In the meantime, we can take care of the asparagus. Okay, here we have the asparagus. This is really the, the German noble vegetable. You peel the whole thing. Why do you peel it? Because the peel is just too thick. Why on earth is this dish called paperclip asparagus? The thing is normally you cook asparagus in water, but then okay. all the taste goes, goes into, into the, the water. water. Exactly. So I have a little bit of sugar, a little bit of salt, and a little bit of melted butter. The important thing is that the spares of asparagus don't lie on top of each other. And then I wrap this up just like a book. Like a pedal. And then you see why it's called paper clip asparagus because I close this one with these huge paper clips. Mary Lise, could you put this two packs in the oven for me? No problem. Okay, okay. wonderful. And where? So this one goes on the bottom. Why? Because I want the sugar to caramelize. Oh, so you need the intense heat. Yeah, that's it. I need the intense heat from underneath. If I put it on a tray in the middle, it would take so too much time. It would be, how do you say it? Soggy. Soggy. Soggy <laughs> and not crispy. And like this, I have the taste of the oh, little right. bit burned sugar. It just takes 10 minutes, so we have enough time to take <gasps> care of the Look crayfish. Look at these little fellas. Yeah. And they are. See here, it's very important that they are still alive because when they're dead, I would poison you and me. And when they're dead, I would throw them away. So we have to put them into the water alive, but we have salted water to cook them just for 10 seconds. And we put them into this iced water now. First. Okay, and that instantly just stops them cooking, doesn't it? Well, we can take them out of the water now. And now we have to remove our... Uh, yeah what's inside. We take the crayfish like that, we take the tail, and then we turn the tail a little bit. And then you pull. And we pull. Hey! And the inside comes out. And that's getting rid of all the kind of nasty intestine bit that you don't want yes. to eat. So now we put it into the stock. Okay. And there's, a, there's a rule. They have around 100 gram, and they say one minute per 100 gram. And they've gone even, the colour's changed even more now, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Now we take out the tails and we take out the claws. The, the tail I just turn around okay. and I squeeze the tail just yeah. like this, a little bit. And then I take the outside away. <laughs> Oops, they're still alive. <laughs> I could 
just yeah, eat that right now. Yeah, in fact, that's that's the the pure mm. the pure taste. Okay. In fact, we are nearly ready. You could do me a favor and brown a little butter in this saucepan. I'm gonna chop a little chofel. You could have a look at the asparagus. Look at that. Little bit of magic. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's okay. Perfect. Okay, there's this a brown butter. Ready. Yeah, brown butter. Salt. A little bit of salt. And, okay, the crayfish goes in now. We add a little lime juice. We add the truffle. Just toss it around okay. a little bit. And I'm going to open your cado, your springtime I'm ready for cado. Me. The smell of heaven. Wow. And we put the crayfish. The little devil's going on the top. Ooh. Just on top of the asparagus and your springtime cuddle. Must be the luckiest girl in the world. <laughs> I've got the wine that matches the taste of the asparagus, the crayfish, and the chervil just uh -huh. perfectly. This is a 2001 Riesling, Westhofener Riesling uh, from Wittmann, and this is just perfect with its acidity and fruitiness. That is mm. delicious, really. So, can we go? We go on now. Hmm? You know, I'm not going to use my knife and fork. Ah, this is no fork and knife dish. This is this Put is tear it open. This is. <laughs> This All is hard work. a fun dish. Okay, here we go. <gasps> Crayfish. Mmm. Mm. Isn't it good? Mm. Mm -hmm. I'm heading northwest now, on my way to the great German port of Hamburg. This is Hamburg, the port city from which five million people emigrated to the USA, Canada and Australia between 1850 and 1934, taking with them the special dishes of the various German regions. Today, Hamburg is renowned for its vibrant nightlife and the thrills and spills of the Reeperbahn. Now, any reasonable person might think this is the home of the hamburger, but any reasonable person would be wrong. Now this is the fricadelle. It's made from ground beef and here it's known as the hamburger steak. Now the recipe was taken across to the States where, as legend has it, an Ohio snack seller gave it a new lease of life by placing it inside a bread roll. Now the hamburger is fighting for its position on the mean streets of Hamburg. But wait, there's competition for the king of fast food and the name's Donna. Donna Kebab. Now, this is a delicious mix of marinated lamb, lettuce, yogurt dressing, delicious bread, and in fact, it's a Turkish-influenced thing, but it's the biggest selling fast food in Germany. Right, time to leave the city and head into the German countryside. Germany's prosperity is directly linked to the humble potato, which made it possible for the land to sustain a growing population over three centuries. Not surprisingly, Germans can use potatoes for almost anything. In Lübeln, there's even a potato hotel. Here you can enjoy the delights of potato soup, potato schnapps, fried potatoes, boiled potatoes, or drink potato juice for medicinal purposes. That is absolutely revolting. You could even be a couch potato yourself, or just slap it all over your face as a moisturizing treatment. This is a very strange sensation. It feels rather cold, it smells a bit like sort of damp compost. In fact, I feel a bit like a spudgy look like. How do I look? Now it's lunchtime, and I've taken this rather mad looking menu, which is made out of a potato sack. They're so totally potato obsessed here. And I've ordered the potato soup, which is a house speciality, and something called a potato party, which sounds very strange indeed. <laughs> now I know why it's called the potato party. Danke schön. Potato schnapps. I think I'm going to start with the soup. Healthy after my um, my little detox. Mmm. Believe it or not, this thing in the middle is a whole potato. And this looks very cool. A little individual with a bit of dippy thing going on here. 
Mm. Mm, very nice. So after all that healthiness, there's only one thing a girl's got to do. Down her potato schnapps. It's got a kick like a mule. I think I need another detox after that. I'm heading south now to try the fruits of the vine along the Great Rhine Valley and from there to the beautiful Black Forest. The Rhineland has been a wine growing area for over 2,000 years, but for a long time wine buffs treated Rhine wines with derision. Now this is definitely changing. Bacharach lies at the heart of the wine cultivation area of the Middle Rhine. They like to make their wine a little less alcoholic and slightly sweeter here, and German Riesling is becoming increasingly popular, particularly in America. Jochen Ratzenberger's vineyard is renowned for its high-quality wines, in particular, its sect. So German wine, especially the Riesling, it's very healthy and very fruity, and so it is... Uh... Because of this, it's a big renaissance at this moment. And do you think it's because it's so delicious with certain foods? This is right. Uh, we, we also uh, eat often Thai food also, and it's very delicious. It's fine uh, in smelling and also, and also in tasting, and it's very light in alcohol, and it's very healthy. I have to say, I love Thai food, and it is the perfect wine to drink with it. So what sect are we going to try? It is uh, from our estate, from the winery Ratzenberger. And it's a Riesling Brutsekt of the year 1999. It is very fruity because of long, uh, long time sunshine and it's very ripe. And we also have it minimum two years on the yeast. And uh, because of this, it's very fine, it's very mineralic taste and also very fine bubbles. Well, I think we should try some of these fine bubbles. <laughs> I would like to try it with you together. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, let's, let's do it. Perfect. Now this is very popular in America, isn't it? This particular type of, um, of sect here we yes. have. It is very fruity, it's uh, a lot of kinds of fruits. You have peach, apricot and also citrus. Frost. Frost. Now after an afternoon of great sect, there's nothing I like better than a little nap. So where best than in one of these? Hotel Lindenwirt in Rudersheim have transformed these traditional wine barrels into cosy little rooms, so nighty night. For centuries the Rhine has been the great German waterway. Even in the Middle Ages it brought wealth to those living on its banks. Huge castles were built by landowners able to levy taxes on goods being brought up the river. Today, medieval banquets are big business. Chef Rudy Steiger is an expert in the recipes of the period. Hi, Rudy. <laughs> is it OK if I come and have a look what you're doing? What are you making for us yeah. for our supper? I do your uh, pate today, yeah? We have here the venison meat. Which is the lovely dark one. Uh, here we have uh, pork meat. It can be a little bit more fat. This is soaked uh, sandwich bread with uh, milk and eggs, apples and onions. Delicious. And what we need also is here... Spices. I might use spices, yeah. It's uh, pepper is inside, coriander, and thyme, rosemary, juniper berries, yeah. Juniper, but very medieval. And we need a little bit salt. The word pate can mean like something you'd put on toast, but in old times, yeah. pate was more like a, it's like a pie really, isn't it? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Pastry was like a tin in the middle oh. age. Yeah, for to preserve the meat, yeah. I'm going to put my feet up after all that hard work. Okay. You pop that in the oven. I, I do it in the oven now, yeah? 45 minutes, okay. it will be done, yeah? Pork and venison pâté. Mm. Sehr, sehr gut. Really delicious. Beef consommé. Now we're going to have the second course. And as you can see, this is the bread bowl. It's like bread that's been dried out in the oven, so it's quite hard. 
and inside is my beef consomme, which I'm going to have a go at. Mm, it's delicious. It's like a really good beef stock. And then inside there's some carrots and some leeks and some cabbage. And it's actually really tasty. Pike pert dumplings. Mm -mm. And these pike perch dumplings, I have to say, pike is not a favourite of mine, but it tastes really good. There's a butter sauce and some crayfish. But I'm telling you something, this bread's always been left over since the medieval times. You could stone a crow with this stuff, and I'm... Can't even break it. Oh, hey! Roast suckling pig. <laughs> wow, check out that pig. Whole roasted pig. It's been roasted with salt and pepper. It's enormous, and I think I can probably squeeze him just a little bit. I don't think I'll be eating that with my spoon. I guess there's only one way to do this. That's the medieval way. <laughs> Simurina with dried fruits. <laughs> with this left, I don't think so. <laughs> I've come to Baden-Württemberg, nestled in the corner of Germany's Swiss and French borders. This is the Black Forest. Germany's orchard, described by Goethe as an abundance of good things. This is where three of the great elements of Germany's culinary tradition come together. Wonderful local ingredients, the love of preserving, and of course, drink. Schnapps is the great German contribution to shot drinking. It can be made from a variety of different ingredients with all kinds of flavors, and the Germans like to use it as a chaser with the local beer. This is Kirsch, a cherry liqueur, and it's an essential ingredient in a cake. I'm going to learn how to bake. This is master baker Eberhard Holtz, and we're going to make the ultimate Black Forest Gatto. So let the masterclass in Black Forest Gatto begin. Right, Mr. Holtz, where do we start? Eggs and sugar, classic beginning of a cake. Okay. Oh, no, this is a special trick that you have, isn't it? Because by warming the eggs, it starts to help it volumise, doesn't it? Perfect. Okay. Yeah, it's really important to get as much air into the cake as possible. That's what makes a cake light and fluffy. Look at the difference in colour. It's really pale now. And this is a mixture of cocoa powder and flour. And we're going to fold it in really gently. Because, again, we don't want any of the air to escape here. So really gently fold it in. Yeah. Now we're adding some melted butter. OK, now we're going into our double-lined tin. And this ensures that the cake is going to be really, really flat. Perfect. And that's 20 minutes? 20 minutes. Perfect. Cherries now. Because the, the juice here is going to be part of our cake, isn't it? So we need to make our sauce, don't we? A little. A little of the juice, okay. About a tablespoon and a half of sugar. 
Now this is really fine flour. It's used in the same way as corn flour. And it's going to add as a thickener. So this is a really fantastic ingredient I've never ever come across before. And it's like a roasted peel of lemons, which is then dried out and then it's whizzed with sugar. Ah, now cinnamon, classic, classic ingredient. Wow, that smells so good. Now this is going to thicken our sauce over here, which is boiling. That juice has come up to the boil. And the reason why you don't add the flour to a large quantity of liquid is it would make it go lumpy. So you get a smooth consistency first, and then you add it into the liquid. And you'll see in a minute, this will get really thick and delicious. Okay, now it's time to put the cherries in. And we just want to heat those through. So we're going to put it into a bowl to cool and thicken. And you can already see that the consistency of the liquid has changed. that needs to stay here for 24 hours because it's much easier to handle when it's cold. Now the fun bit, putting the cake together. Okay, so we're going to divide it up into layers now. And because it's been left for 24 hours, it's really settled and it makes it much, much easier to work with. We're going to get a layer of chocolate on this. Now that's actually going to go in the fridge and rest and go completely solid, which will form a sort of bottom to the cake. <laughs> <laughs> they used to do pastry like this, but that's much heavier. This is a much, much lighter way of doing it. So that's gone completely hard and that's going to act as a base. I've got here some sugar syrup and being here in Germany, we're going to add the Kirsch water. Another one? Yeah. I think we should share a little bit. For you. <laughs> Kirsch water. Ah. Be very careful not to over whip the cream, it will turn to butter and it doesn't taste very nice. Next layer. More Kirsch water. More cream. Some more cream to cover the outside. Just in case we didn't have enough cream, we're going to pipe some more on the top. That's so clever. That must be the biggest bar of chocolate I have ever seen in my life. Oh, that's clever. I get to do the finishing touches. He does all the hard work. Bravo. Well done. Oh. Very good. Now it's four o'clock and in Germany that means it's cafe and kuchen or coffee and cake time. So, Mr. Holtz, coffee? Yes. And then we're going to try the fruits of our labour. Yeah. Oh, we've definitely deserved this. So. Une poule qui pond tous les matins. Colin a une poule qui pond tous les matins. Elle a été faire sa ponte dans la cour à Martin sur le. Colin a une poule qui pond tous les matins. Elle a été faire sa ponte dans la cour à Martin sur le. I remember now, yes. Ça va les deux Do you remember, honey? I can hear the guitar. I'm sorry, I think it's mandolin's music. Really, my little sister. How many different ways are there to say I love you? Ti voglio bene. Te quiero. Ich liebe dich. 
Je t'adore vraiment Sur le bord du vaisseau Colin, as-tu une poule qui pond tous les matins Colin, as-tu une poule qui pond tous les matins elle a été faire sa ponte dans la cour à Martin sur le Colin, as-tu une poule qui pond tous les matins Elle a été faire sa ponte dans la cour à Martin sur le I remember now, yes. Ça dans l'air de ça, Do you remember, honey? I can have the guitar. I'm sorry, I think it's mandolin's music. Really, my little trucker. How many different ways are there to say I love you? Ti voglio bene. Te quiero. Ich liebe dich. <laughs> 